morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We've been focusing on the topic of a Pentecostal powerhouse, and what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse? And we are comparing it to the individual who goes to the gym every single week. And he does that at least probably five days a week. For the person who's really adamant about going to the gym and working out, they probably go about five days a week. We have one day, back day, so forth and so forth. Why? Because they are trying to exercise the whole body and get the whole body in shape. When we look at us as Christians, we are taking that and flipping it to our spirituality. That we may become spiritual powerhouses. That we, and what I mean by that is that we may become fluid in the things of the Spirit. How do we become fluid in the, in the things of the Spirit? This exact same way that the person who goes to the gym becomes a, a powerhouse or a bodybuilder. By doing it consistently. Doing it almost every single day. For us spiritually, it is doing it every single day. Praying every single day. And I don't mean just a, a Lord lay me down to sleep prayer or God bless his food, because if we're being honest, there have been times when we probably prayed for God to bless his food, and really, our heart wasn't in it. We just did it out of routine or habit, and bless his food to our bodies, amen, just so we could eat. But constantly engaging ourselves in prayer where we meet God face to face. Reading our Bible, and not just to read it and get it over with for the day, or reading it because we have to, but reading it with an intent that, Lord, let the Holy Ghost speak to me with what I'm reading today. That I may grow deeper in spiritual things, that I may know you like never before. Fasting to show submission that this old flesh isn't going to keep us from getting to God, but that we're going to set it aside and do whatever it takes. Constantly working on those spiritual things. Constantly attaining the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if we have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, some people, they get it when they receive salvation. For those of us, sometimes it takes it a little bit longer. And that is what we've been talking about, is uh, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let me get back in my notes a little bit. But we began looking last week at the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we learned from John chapter 14, 17. If someone would please read John 14, 17 one more time. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him. For he dwells within you and shall be in you. So we see two different locations of the Holy Ghost in this position. We find Jesus is talking to the disciples, telling them about the coming of the Comforter that he's going to send. And he says that he is with you, but he shall be in you. So there's a difference there. Is the baptism of the Holy Ghost different than that of salvation? And we're going to get off our notes, and we're probably going to be all over the place a little bit this morning, but is the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how do we know that there is something different between just salvation and the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Do you guys have any thoughts? What is... How do we know that there's a difference? Is there any scriptural evidence supporting that? The biggest evidence is the speaking in tongues. The biggest evidence is the speaking in tongues. But, let me say, put myself in the camp of the critic. But how do we know you're not just making up stuff? There are churches that will take you in the back room and teach you how to speak in tongues. Say, I want a Honda. Say it fast. Say it faster until all of a sudden it sounds like, I want a Honda. We have Catholics that speak in tongues. <clears throat> we have other groups that speak in tongues. How, now, I, and I'm just saying, what, how do we know it is a different experience altogether? We know that tongues is the evidence of speaking in tongues, but anybody can speak in tongues. And we'll, we'll get more about this a little bit. Don't think I'm picking on you, Jack. We're just, uh -huh. we're rolling along here. The difference is, don't make a decision. 
which is a term that you get comes from Father the Son. I agree with you wholeheartedly, brother. I completely agree with you. But we're back in the same boat. How do we know that it's different? Yes. The Bible, the Bible tells us that when that occurs, there are one of two things that will also be present. Either a person to whom the, the word spoken in tongues is for, who understands what it is and perceives the word, or someone to interpret what is said for the body. Okay. Um, when we get down to that kind of stuff, it's hard to separate, but there is a difference between the gift of tongues, which is one of the gifts of the Spirit, which is kind of what you're referring to right here, Jeff, versus the person who um, speaks in tongues under the baptism of the Holy Ghost um, with praying in tongues. Because I can go off to the side and I can pray in my own prayer language and I don't need anybody to interpret it. It's for me. I'm praying to God. Also, there are times when I don't know what to pray to God, so the Spirit is praying through me. I don't need somebody there to interpret because the gift of tongues is for the body. And at this point, that's kind of more what you're referencing. Okay. Brother Eli referenced it once last week, and I kind of brushed it over because I'm trying to keep it separate because it is hard to distinguish, especially I, if we don't study it enough, if we're not careful, because they can blend together. They really can. Well, that's kind of my stumbling block because I don't know where the line is that separates them, and I've been studying it for many, several years now. Okay. I, well, I'm still a little confused. The big difference for me between the gift of tongues and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is this. The baptism is for the believer. The gift of tongues is for the entire body. There might be times when a person uh, takes off in tongues during worship service and maybe the music stops because they think God's trying to speak. And maybe God is trying to speak and there's supposed to be somebody in that purpose, but sometimes somebody gets a little bit excited. And is it a bad thing? No. but. They're just receiving their blessing from God. But there are other times when God wants to bring forth a message to the entire congregation. And that is the gift of tongues. And that is where one person might give the gift, gift of tongues, and it's basically the Holy Ghost using that person to say, Hey, I want to speak here! And then you have the person that interprets. Because if I take off in tongues, that edifies nobody but me. Um, but when the interpretation comes out, well, then it's understandable. And then everybody else can understand what God is speaking because there has been somebody to interpret it. Am I correct in understanding, though, that in both cases, the, the I guess if you want to use the, the term language, when you're speaking in tongues is what's considered a heavenly language or the language of the angels or... I mean, I've heard it referred to in different ways. But. I know, and we're going to watch a video here, and it's taken from a secular standpoint. At least I plan on watching a video today. If not, we will at some point. But um, they actually take you that it is a heavenly language, which we are told that as Pentecostals, by the time that we are seeking the baptism, that is a heavenly language. That is a heavenly language. It can be the tongues of man, too. There have been cases where in a church where tongues are given forth, and guess what? There's no interpretation. But the tongues that was given forth was from a man's language, and there was somebody else sitting in the congregation that day that knew that language. And even though the person that gave the tongues didn't know it, that person understood it, and it was perfect. And because of that, that person got saved and came to Christ, because God was speaking to them through the person giving the tongues. Okay. So I don't... See that it can be a tongue of man, or of just angels. I see that it's a tongue of man, and it, or it could be of angels. It could be one or the other. Um, at some point, we'll probably talk about Topeka, Kansas, because for us as Pentecostals, here in America, American Pentecostals, we know of it today, actually began back in 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, at a place called Bethel Bible School. A girl named Agnes Osman began, uh, was the first one to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And she was so remarkable that had people come in and look at her, you know, like they do today, I'm sure. Not that it was uncommon for the school, because they were seeking to see what Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 meant. What is this? And she's recorded of speaking and writing nothing but Chinese for a week. When she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, she wasn't necessarily... Uh, speaking a heavenly language, but she was um, speaking perfect Chinese. 
something she never studied before. So from everything I've read and studied and seen, it can be one or the other. It doesn't have to be just heaven. Us as Pentecost, we always, even as the preacher will get up and we'll preach, uh, maybe pray in the heavenly language, it could be one or the other. If you've ever heard somebody take off at times, sometimes it sounds like a certain dialect of maybe from another country or something. I know I had one woman tell me, you know, some already, that sometimes when I take off in tongues, that it sounded more like I was speaking Indian, not Bom not uh, whoa, 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 but more Bombay, Calcutta, over there. It has that kind of dialect to it. So from everything I've seen, everything I've studied, while men and preachers might say that it's a heavenly language, I'm not denying it, because it comes through the Holy Ghost. But the language itself could it be angels, or it could be man. But one thing is clear. It is a language that the person who is, who is speaking it does not know. If you know French, and you take off seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden you start pe speaking perfect French, a language that you know, that is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence in other tongues is a tongues or a language that is unfamiliar and uncommon to you. Does that clear anything up? Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Uh, because I know uh, my parents is an in pray for somebody in the hospital. And he was speaking in tongues. And he interpreted it. And a woman I was gotten into for the chief of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And she, she said he interpreted it exactly what he, he said in tongues. Yeah. Oh, I believe that. When we say that, let me just back up. When we say that it's a heavenly language, there's a language in heaven. But let's keep in mind that when we're praying in tongues, it's not us praying the language. It's the Holy Ghost praying through us. And because of that, we are going to stop right now and we're going to watch a video because I think this is going to be interesting because it falls right along the lines of what we're talking about right now. We're way off our notes and it's all right. <laughs> The whole point of Sunday school is to, for us all to learn so we're all on the same page. I'm not in a hurry. Because what is the point of teaching something if no one understands it? Amen. Let's just stop here.